It is good to be back. Uh, I, 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 I actually honestly can say I really love speaking to you guys. Uh, it really is an honour and privilege to preach to people that are hungry. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm going to say this first and foremost, and I'm sure Pastor Graham would agree, uh, and those that have travelled a lot, and it, it, sometimes it's tough as a speaker. Sometimes it's just tough because you feel like you're speaking to people that don't want to be, don't, don't want to be talked to. Does that make sense? And I, I really don't feel that here. I do feel uh, such an openness and such a desire to grow and change. And even for some of us, and listen, please don't hear this the wrong way, but even for some of us that don't like change, I can still feel that you want change. You know what I mean? Some of you know what I'm saying. Just blink if you agree with me. Amen. Come on. You know, you can, te- you can always feel the tension in the air at different times there. You know, when you're pressing certain buttons. I mean, we're leaders. This is a leadership meeting now. We should be able to talk uncensored. Amen. We should be able to talk at this. But you know when you're pressing on buttons with some people, like they're trying to pretend you're putting on your best Christian face, but it's not working. I can see through it. You know what I mean? Because we've been around there. I've been where you've been. I've sat in the same chair and I've listened to people as change is happening. And I, I, as much as I like to think that I'm a contemporary guy, I like to move forward. I still like some things, you know, and, uh, but the, the, it's moving forward. Amen. The, 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 the message never changes, but the methods must. If we're going to continue to reach a generation and generations of people, things change, man. You know what I mean? We've got a generation of people that are coming up these days that are so tech savvy. Uh, You know, Pastor Graham and I were sitting down having a breakfast today. We were eating char seeds and oats. And then we went for a 30K run. (laughs) And then, you know, we, we, uh, we beat the bag for about 30 minutes and then she got up and made us breakfast. Okay, so <laughs> I'm just trying to see if I can wake some of you up. You're still just looking at me, God is crazy. No, it's not true. We had bacon and eggs. That's what we had. But we just talked about, we were just talking about different things about reaching generations and the next generation and what's happening. And I don't mean this as a, a belittle statement, but I'm, I, I, there's a part of me that's nervous about the next generation because we're getting smarter instruments. We're getting smarter technology. And the problem is the smarter the phones, the dumber the people. It's the truth, right? It's the truth. People don't communicate anymore. People, some people don't even know how to have a conversation anymore. They know how to FaceTime, but they don't know how to do real FaceTime. They don't know how to have a communication. They don't even know how to spell these days. If they can't share it in an emoticon, it's all over, man. You know what I mean? I don't know what a face with love hearts in your eyes means. You know what I mean? It's just stupid. Seriously, your eyes have never looked like that. That just tells me you've got bloodshot eyes that are shaped like hearts. You know what I'm saying? It's like, what's happened to a generation? I'm talking about even for us that are trying to embrace it. Let's not lose the power of touch. Touch still changes people's lives. Amen. We've got to touch people's hearts, not just educate their minds. And it is, it's, it's a challenge for us as preachers, as us as churchgoers, as people that want to invite people into an environment where they go into such crazy places. Now, you can go into cafes and you can go into restaurants and they've got all sorts of whiz-bang latest fandangle instruments and that sort of stuff there. It's, it's, it's moving forward, amen. And it's not the fact that we're there to compete against the world, but we certainly have to be a place that actually is comparable to the fact that God, this is God. God's house. Amen. And some people come into God's house and they see an organ with pipes reaching to heaven. Some guys still speaking in King James language and dressed in robes. Jesus doesn't wear robes. And I don't think he'd come riding on a donkey now. I think he'd drive a Harley. I think he would. I don't think he would. Why ride a donkey when you can have a Harley Davidson? I mean, that's just ridiculous. How do you do a burnout in the car park with a donkey? Do you understand? He's, he's up to date. Jesus is more up to date than, than Apple will ever be. Amen? Come on, folks. You need to understand that. And we, 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 need to, we need to not be afraid of moving forward. It's not all bad. But it is scary for us. Some of us that are a little bit older, a little bit stayed, and that, some of the new praise and worship that comes out, it's just changing, man. But the one thing that I look at is I look for the fruit. I, I look for the fruit loops as well, but I look for the fruit. You understand? <laughs> There's plenty of fruit loops in church, man. If, you, if you're crazy, you belong in the house of God because it seems to be a poetic license to be a nut job and just call it Christianity. You, you, you understand? But I look for the fruit. So when I see young kids worshipping to a, to a song that I don't particularly like, but I see them falling in love with Jesus, then it's working. Amen? Praise God. And we've got, we can't be afraid of these sorts of things there, guys. And I, I just want to stir you because it, it is great when I hear uh, uh, Pastor Simon and, and the most incredible team here 
at his church uh, that just have a passion to move forward, to have a passion to see this, this place won. Amen? That, that, that this, this church is far too small. Far too small. And it still will remain too small while there are people going to hell. Amen? Your greatest competition is not the church down the road. Your greatest competition is the devil right outside these doors stealing people's lives. We're not here to compete against other churches. If another church starts doing something better than you, don't get jealous. Get stirred. Ask the questions. Amen? I, 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 can, we can talk very frank right now. I'll preach quickly. I'll even finish on time. But you know, uh, you know, in Malaysia, when, when I went over to Malaysia in 2013, I had a passion for Malaysia since 1999. It was a love affair. I fell in love with that country. I asked God to break my heart for that country. It was the only place that I'd ever traveled to that I actually prayed that prayer. And you know what? You've got to be careful what you pray because God answers those prayers. And what happened is God began to break my heart for a country. And every time I'd fly in on Malaysian Airlines back in those days from Adelaide, and I'd hear these words as the plane's descending, Salamat datang, tuan tuan don puan puan, which means, welcome to Malaysia. Mr. and Mrs. It actually just means that, simply that. But every time they said those words, I would just, something would break in me. And I'd ask God to do it again. And I fell in love with that country. And, and 14 years later, I moved over there to, to look after a church. And the church just grew exponentially. I don't say it arrogantly. It's just a fact. It grew exponentially. There were 600 people attending church on a Sunday. There were 1,000, just over 1,000 people on the full database. Now in KL, there's 6,700 people on the database with 3,500 people attending church every Sunday. That's the lowest attendance. It's just grown by over 600%. And you know what happened is the people that were excited about me coming over, other churches, then got offended because they got intimidated because we're growing so fast. And I started, real, I'm not your competition. We're supposed to be complementing each other. We're seeing people saved. I didn't know it was a competition to see who could have the biggest church. And we go, you're the fastest growing church in Malaysia, in Malaysia right now. I don't, I don't give a rip about that name. And everybody's trying to work out, oh, what's your secret? It must be a great young adult church. It's not even a young adult church. 60% of our church are over 35 years old. And in fact, out of that, 25% are over 50 years old out of the 6,500. So the thing is, this is, but, but it was amazing that the people that should be cheering you on are the ones that are actually despising you now. And I thought, I don't need the devil. I've just got other pastors. Everybody picking on you, putting, saying all sorts of crazy things and that sort of stuff. Now some of them are becoming friends and now I'm actually getting invited to speak at their leadership meetings, which honestly is a real honor. But you know, we get it all mixed up and back to front and upside down instead of just knuckling down and building the house of God. Amen? Come on, folks. We're partnering with Jesus and saying, let's change a city and let's turn it upside down. And part of the struggle is embracing change. Change is inevitable. Now, I know some of you have had the same haircut you've had since you were a boy. I unfortunately don't have that problem because I have no more hair to cut. But you understand what I'm saying? A lot of us, we don't like change. We like watching the old, like talking the old. But we need to move forward and we need not be afraid of it because God purposed you for living now. Amen? Is that okay, folks? It's just my warm up. But I just want to share a passage of scripture. I talked very briefly about it. In fact, I threw it, threw it in as a side thing with the staff the other day. And it's, it's, I'm calling the message for us, it's called the test of faith. Amen. How many people know your faith is going to get tested? And God won't tempt you, but he, do, he certainly will test you. And chances are the tests are going to come because of a result of your prayer. If you prayed, I want to be more like Jesus, you need to understand what you just said. Amen. If you were just thinking walking on water, feeding multitudes with one McDonald's McHappy Meal. That's only one aspect of what it's like to be like Jesus, amen? To be like Jesus means you get stabbed in the back by people you love, people that you care for. Sometimes there's no place to lay your head. Sometimes even the people that you help the most are actually gonna turn and say, I don't like you anymore. Come on, folks. Eh? This is what happens when we begin to pray. I wanna be more like Jesus. Glow in the dark eyes. <laughs> Let me tell you, there's a lot more that happens when you pray prayers like that, Amen. Are you okay, folks? Now, listen, if you're leaders, you better start amening me right now because I expect some amens from you. Amen? All right, don't you mess around with me. And if you fold your arms during the whole of my message as a leader, I'm gonna kick your butt. Are you understand? Leaders lead, amen? 
I didn't get up early to come and meet with a bunch of deadheads staring at me going, whatever. <laughs> Wake up! All right, the devil's already active. Get active, Christian. Come on, folks. There, yeah, now some of you go, sit there just staring at me. I know I'm beautiful. You can get a photo with me later on, okay? All right, are we okay now, folks? We woke some of you up now. Praise God. There's only nine gifts of the Spirit listed in the Bible. I got the 10th one. It's called gift of annoyance. I'm gonna ring your bell. I'm gonna ring your bell. You try and shut me out, you'll dream about me tonight. Amen. You'll be looking up at the ceiling going, I should have listened to him. Amen. Are we okay, church? Praise God. I don't come here by accident. I come here on purpose. Amen. I, I, I want to say this, and, and Simon's honoured me very much so, and so the stuff. I come as a son. I'm not a guest speaker. I'm family. So you better get used to me because I'll follow you in heaven. <laughs> I'm sleeping over at your mansion. See, you can't escape me, man. We're going to be together for eternity. <laughs> Are we okay? Praise God. Somebody goes, hey, hey, hey. Let's turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. See, this is actually going to line up with what I've just said to some of you. It's going to be real good, right? It says this, Matthew 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. I love the fact that the disciples think they're crying out after her. No, they didn't. They just said Jesus. Disciples always want to get in on the act, amen? You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, they, they, they keep on bothering us, Jesus. Jesus goes, no, loser. <laughs> it's moi. <laughs> you simply carry my drinks. Where was I up to? But he answered, verse 24, but he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. I, I really want to speak to you over the next literally 28 minutes. It's going to be nice and quick. All right, and then we're going to have a nice break. I want to talk to you about the test of faith because one thing you need to understand, when you signed up for leadership, you actually asked God to test you. If you only signed up for leadership because you wanted your name on some bulletin at church, uh, you wanted an L in front of your name, we can give you an L. You can carry an L around for the rest of your days. If you only wanted it for the title, then you've, you've forgotten what it's all about. All right, you need to understand. I, I said to the staff, and I've believed this ever since the day I first heard it, was the moment you become a leader, you gave up your right of being right. Uh, you, in fact, you asked to become the greatest follower when you become a leader. And this is the thing. When you ask to be a leader, you actually ask God to test you. You know, uh, a scripture that was shared just the other day, that if you desire to be a teacher, you're going to be held even more accountable. You take people on a journey, let me tell you, you're going to be answerable to God for the people that God entrusted you to lead. You are going to have to give an account. You can't blame anybody else. If you take people on a journey, God's going to go, what did you do with the sheep I gave you? What did you do with the people that I put underneath you to teach and lead? He's going to ask you these sorts of questions. There's going to be a greater accountability. Billy Graham said, to be a leader or a preacher in the church is a higher calling than to be called the President of the United States. You need to understand there is a revelation that we all need to get that what an honour it is and a privilege it is to be a leader. Not the privilege for the church that we are one of their leaders. It is a privilege to be a leader. Amen. I love doing what I do. But I said to the staff, I don't love leadership. I love people. People that love leadership make very bad leaders. People that love people make exceptional leaders. Amen. You, you got to fall in love with the people, not the title. Is this okay? So there's going to be tests that are going to come along your way, the tests of faith. The first test that you're going to get as a leader, as we read in Scripture, is here, is the test of being ignored. Amen. Some of you don't want to amen that one, right? Let me just say that again, the test of being ignored. 
Just like you're ignoring me right now. Praise God, I love that. See, when you become a leader, this is what we see in the Scripture here. The first test you're gonna go through, or not, not the first test, but a test you will go through is the test of being ignored. Look at this. This woman comes pleading and the Bible says that he didn't even answer her. He didn't even acknowledge her. I wonder in this place here, no show of hands, you ever been ignored? You ring the pastor's phone and it just keeps on ringing out. Not just Pastor Simon, by the way, any of the staff. Ever felt ignored here? Don't you love that silence? I can actually hear the air conditioners perfectly right now. (laughs) I'll take that as an amen. Ever felt ignored? Ever felt like no one's listening to you? Ever felt that you're all alone when it comes to your leadership? You see, I've got to tell you, folks, it's a test that comes along the way. It's a test that actually happens when you get involved in leadership. There are times where you are going to feel like you're ignored. He didn't even answer her. He didn't even try and say, not now. I mean, come on, man. This is Jesus we're talking about. Jesus, the one who loves everybody, the one who dies for everybody living on the planet, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He died for them all. Now there's one of them going, Jesus, I need your attention. I mean, Lord, she's even admonishing him, speaking to him, and he doesn't even acknowledge that she's there. Have you ever felt like that, people? Come on. If you haven't felt like that, just wait a little longer. Come on, folks. It's a test that actually happens. It's a test that actually comes upon your faith. You get bypassed. Have you ever noticed that sometimes you, 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 you might have been the person that was always noticed, but now you're bypassed because someone else has come in. And there's a feeling like, what happened to me? Come on, folks. I, I used to stir the guys in Singapore. Singapore is really funny. It's a, a 95% Chinese culture. And they, they have a Chinese culture, which is this. You've got to respect people's space. So you don't kind of, you just give them room to breathe. But the problem is it's gone to the nth degree and now no one talks to anybody. And I used to say to people, if I want to, feel, if I want to be ignored and I want isolation, I'll move to Singapore. Because you can actually walk into a jam-packed elevator and no one will, they'll look at you and then they'll look down. Even as you're in mid-sentence going, hello, they go, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Have you ever felt like that? Do you know how easy it is to come into church? Listen, we can come into church like this. I can go into church and I can still have no one say hello to me, no one say anything to me, and I can walk out the same way. And it's happened, it's happened, man. I've been to churches where I'm the guest speaker and I feel ignored by everybody. Even the pastor, I spoke at a church a while back, even the pastor didn't sit with me. I'm sitting in the front row by myself. I'm like, what the hell's wrong with me, man? What's wrong with me? And at the end, finally the pastor comes up. What do you think of our church? I said, I didn't like it. I felt by myself, man. You ever felt ignored? Come on, folks. Let me ask you this question. If you feel ignored, I wonder how many other people do. Come on. Come on, are we okay, church? Can we, we gotta talk as leaders here, folks. See, there's a test that's gonna happen. There are times when you're going to feel ignored. So what do you do? Do you leave? See, this is the bottom line. This woman, she felt ignored. There is something, there's times in your life as a leader that even though you're doing all the right things, even though you may be doing all the right things, moving in the right direction, going that, there's still times where you are gonna be tested by being ignored. Now, it doesn't mean that anybody's plotting to ignore you. It just happens. And you know when it happens? It happens often when you're actually going through a hard time. Come on, folks. If you're going through a good time, it doesn't even affect you. But when you're going through a bad time, how many people know they say when it rains, it pours? I mean, it's not biblical, but it's Murphy's Law. Whoever Murphy was, yeah, reason for it. Probably just some drunk Irish guy, I don't know. But There's a test of being ignored. That's the first test that we see here. The second test is this one. The second test is the test of being excluded. What did Jesus reply when she finally begins to call out again? And he goes, I have only come for the lost sheep of Israel. I mean, first of all, he ignores her. But then he excludes her. I don't want to talk to you. I don't come to talk to people like you. 
I've only come for the lost sheep of Israel. You ever felt excluded? Oh, come on, folks. I don't mind this. This silence is okay. I know this is not really a big amen sermon, right? You know what I'm saying? It's not a massive amen one, but it's one that will make you think. So you go from being ignored and you think it can't get any worse, but oh, it can. So now what I do is, first of all, I don't even acknowledge you. And then when I finally acknowledge you, I go, I don't, I don't talk to you. <laughs> we, we don't dialogue. I need to speak to ministers. Come on, folks. There's a test of being excluded when you get involved in leadership. Now, by the way, I'm not setting you up because we're about to exclude you all. So don't read in between the lines and find something that isn't there. But what I'm saying is there's a test we can see here of being excluded. Have you ever felt like you've been replaced? Or been misplaced? Not even acknowledged? Well, let me ask you something here. Here's a real good one, right? This is what I've often found in a growing church is we go from a place of where we used to know everything that was going on. But now we don't know everything that's going on. And it gets even worse. We find out from somebody what's going on. And that somebody is the same person we used to tell what's going on. Oh, I love your silence. This is beautiful. This is the emotional moment for me. Let me just go get the violin. Come on, folks. It happens. The larger the church begins, you won't find out everything straight away. And there's a challenge on that. Amen? Come on, come on, folks. If you're not going to be honest, I'll be honest, okay? When the church began to grow, this is the bottom line. I was doing my job. I'm building the church. Pastor Mark never employed me to maintain a church. He asked me to grow it. So that's what happened. We began to grow and it grew faster than I could imagine. All of a sudden we filled the place that we were meeting from two times on a Sunday in February 2013 to by the end of the year, we were filling it four times on a, on a Sunday. So we had to find a bigger venue. So we found a venue that was two and a half times the size and we moved into there. And we started with two services and then we grew to three services and then we grew to four services and now we're in five services and we even have people in the overflow room. So I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing. The church is growing, but how many people know it got to a point where I actually, I called up Mark and I said, I need help, man. I'm freaking out. I can't, I, I'm, I'm worried I'm gonna be the bottleneck. I'm, I'm worried I'm gonna slow down this growth because it's just going crazy. One year, I was telling the, that two years ago, our church in KL grew by 77%. We celebrated 3,000 on the database and I bought all the staff lunch and I went, well done guys. Woo, woo, woo. Three months later, we were 4,000. The, ch- the front door just got s- just massive, man. And it wasn't that they were leaving as fast as they're coming, they stayed. So I'm gonna create new services. And finally, I just called Mark and I go, man, I need, I I'm worried, I'm scared. I'm, I'm actually nervous now. I don't know that I can cope with this growth. It's crazy and I'm afraid of being a bottleneck. And so Mark came in because he's got greater eyes, bigger eyes. And he said, you know what? We're gonna have to create senior department heads and they'll run certain meetings. And Matt, you don't need to be a part of those meetings anymore. We'll actually get them running the meetings. And you know what happened? All of a sudden, the very thing I asked for, I'm going, but I, I, liked, I liked being in those meetings. <laughs> and now there's Caleb and the, and, and the service managers and all that having a meeting and I'll be looking through the window. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll find out some decisions and there'd be something on KTV, our news program that I didn't even know about. And I go, <laughs> I used to help make those decisions. <laughs> all of a sudden there's people being, you know, there's even staff that have come on I don't even know about. And the very thing I asked for now, because I'm excluded, I'm having a problem with. And I literally did. I went to Mark and said, he goes, how's it going? I said, I don't know, man. (laughs) My insecurities are coming out. I used to know all this. Now I don't know it. I didn't know this person was coming. I didn't know you were looking at this. What happened to so-and-so? Da-da-da-da-da. And he goes, and he didn't even know about it. He goes, I didn't even know about it. I said, what do you mean you don't know? He goes, well, we put those people in charge. They're running it, but we, we give them leadership but they can make the decisions. It's the only way we're gonna grow. And all of a sudden I went from being included in everything to excluded in stuff. And all of a sudden I had to develop this thing called trust. That the Kingdom City doesn't evolve around Matt Fielder. 
that I'm not the God of Kingdom City. Come on, folks. Now am I speaking to some of your languages? Come on, folks. Now, you know, some of you want to nod and agree, but you're still nervous because you're still struggling with the first one, ignored. (laughs) Come on, folks. There's a challenge to it. When Pastor Graham's talking about the fact that he doesn't even get up and grab the mic sometimes at conferences and people are going, are you okay, Pastor? You're not even grabbing the mic. Shouldn't you be doing something? Because you're, you're the senior guy. But see, you need to understand, the funniest thing is I asked to be excluded, but what I suddenly realised is I didn't like it. And I had to go through this whole new challenge. Like I'm while I'm away, there's a whole bunch of decisions that have been made by some of the staff and I'm going, hey, 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 hey. You know what I mean? Because I realised that there's still part of me. The problem is this, is as leaders, we always want our hands in everybody's pot. It's the same as when Moses is sitting on his great throne and all the people of Israel are coming up for counselling. Millions of them. Oh my God, I couldn't think of anything worse. Can I just ask you, should we do the green curtains or the red curtains? Do you think the air conditioners are actually too big or should we get the little ones? Let me pray. The smaller ones shall do. Come on, man. He's making every decision. He's still got his hand in every pot. Jethro, the father-in-law, thank God for father-in-laws. Well, not always, but you understand. It's a mother in law. Okay, definitely not the mother in law, but absolutely the father. No, I'm kidding. If you're a mother in law in here, more power to you. Don't get angry. Don't throw your teeth at me. Anyway, <laughs> so Jethro goes, What you're doing is wrong. He actually said, What you're doing is wrong. You're wearing yourself out. Your wife and kids never get to see you. You're, te- you're tearing the people apart because they're, they're, they're hanging out for a whole day for just a quick consultation. Appoint leaders. Get out the way. Oh, that's a word for some of you. I mean, leave. And what Moses had to learn to do, he had to appoint 86,500 leaders. How many people know he didn't even appoint all those people? There's no way in the world he picked all those leaders. He just entrusted it to other people. You're not going to sit there and do an interview. <laughs> okay, brother, so how long have you been in ministry? <laughs> oh, since the walking through water? <laughs> okay, come on, man. He didn't interview everybody. They just had to be entrusting for empowering people to become leaders of tens, fifties, hundreds, thousands. Come on, folks. And Moses went from having his hand in every jar to having his finger on the pulse. And that's what I had to do. This is what God spoke to me. He said, Maddie, get your hands out the jar. You can still have your finger on the pulse. So Moses still handled the difficult situations. But if he was trying to handle all the minute stuff, you'll go, you'll go crazy. I mean, we've got to rest. Believe it or not, I know some of you think that us senior pastors are superhuman, but we still like the bed. (laughs) Amen. I was hugging my pillow today. In fact, when I woke up this morning, the pillow said, don't leave. (laughs) Just stay here. But we go through these processes where we feel excluded. That's going to happen. Listen to me, folks. I'm not prophetic. It's not a word of knowledge. It's called common sense. As this church grows, you are going to have to get used to the test of being excluded because there's some areas where you cannot be involved in all the time. And listen, I don't even say it negatively, but I'm just going to give you an observation. I've only been here twice, so I don't actually know how everything runs. But what I do see is I see Jane and I see, uh, I see other worship leaders. I see the same ones, right? Oh my gosh, why did a name just diss out of my pair of mine? Crystal, Crystal. I was about to say, I was going to say diamond for some strange reason, but you know, it's because she's morphing, she's growing. But the thing is, this is, I see them in worship. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing because I actually absolutely love their worship leading. But as this church grows, there's got to be more. I see Jethro and, and, and Grant, Grant's up there. He was going to bring the shofar. You totally ripped me off today, man. You said you were bringing the shofar. And so far, no shofar. (laughs) But I see Grant here. I remember seeing him last time. And I remember seeing Jethro. (laughs) Right, now I'm not too sure about the rest of the musicians because I'm getting old. My mind wanders. But the fact of the matter is, as church grows, that can't happen. That can't happen. Amen? Amen. It's for some of you, if you're a cell group leader or a life group leader and that sort of stuff there and your, your group is supposed to grow, there'll come a time where it needs to multiply. 
And for some of you, some of you run your group like Pharaoh, run Egypt. And Moses has to come in and go, let my people go. Amen. But this is my people. These are my people. No, let them go. Amen. Are we okay, folks? When we grow, it's inevitable. And the third test that she had to go through was the test of being offended. So first of all, she's ignored. Secondly, she felt excluded. And now Jesus goes, listen, I've got one more for you. Dog. Oh, come on, folks. Jesus. Beautiful Jesus. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. The lamb goes, listen, woman, I come here for those. I didn't come for dogs. Come on. You, you, I don't know how you read that. He didn't say it eloquently. I came for the lost sheep of Israel, not the little puppies. <laughs> but bless you. He said, dog. Have you ever been offended by your leadership? Have you ever been offended at church? Come on, folks. If you haven't been offended yet while you're serving, just wait a little longer. We'll get to you. Oh, now, come on, folks. We're not sitting in a meeting trying to work out how to offend you. Not sitting there going, how? listen, they're always happy. What can, we, what, what can we say about them? We're not doing that. But let me tell you, folks, you are going to get offended. Amen? Someone's gonna say something that offends you. Some of you are getting offended by me right now. Welcome to the test. Because I'm not even saying anything offensive. I'm actually saying fact. And if you're offended by that, good luck with the rest of your life. You might as well lock yourself up in a bubble and feed yourself Scripture until Jesus returns because you are going to be offended. Jesus offended people. He was not just called the line of the tribe. He was called the rock of offence. He offended people. John the Baptist, the forerunner to Jesus Christ, the one who said, make straight the path. I'm not He, but I'm the one preparing the way. The one who's coming is greater than me. I mean, he's the ultimate preacher. He's the pathway. He's the red carpet. That Je- and when Jesus appears, he goes, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Boys, follow him. I've got to decrease. He must increase. This is the number one PR agent for Jesus. Now, Scriptures later, he's in jail and he calls his boys and he goes, yo, can you just go check with that guy? What was his name? Jesus? Is he the one we're supposed to be looking for or should we be looking somewhere else? What was the reply when the disciples went to Jesus and asked the question? He said, tell John, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and blessed is he who is not offended on behalf of me. John was dealing with an issue. He was annoyed. He was waiting for Jesus to just bust him out of jail. Come and just take over. You're going to get offended, folks. It's called family. Family. Okay, let me ask you a very simple question for all the arm folders. But some of you guys really fold your arms tight. It's quite amazing. It's amazing. Wait, do you write on your arms the notes of the brilliant message that I'm preaching right now? Or you just squeeze tighter to stop the blood from circulating through the rest of your body? Or does it help you keep an angry looking face? I'm just trying to work out because I love your face. Your face is beautiful. I wish you could take a photo of it and say, this is one of the greatest leaders we have. Yeah. Come join their group. They'll make you happy. Praise God. And now we just got that out of the way. Some of you still got offended again because I'm saying exactly what everybody else thinks. All right? I love you enough to get over this stuff. Does that make sense, right? The thing is, this is, let me ask you a very simple question. How many people here got family? Come on, raise your hands. How many people love their family? How many times would you admit that sometimes you don't love them so much? How many would actually say, sometimes I've actually dreamt about hurting them? In fact, right now I'm thinking about hurting them. In fact, I wanted to hurt some of them this morning. Guess what? They're still family. They're still family. It's, it's, it's called life. And sometimes we're not going to say all the right things. 
Sometimes we're not going to do everything right. You know why? Because we're just like you. Amen? If you're perfect and you've achieved it all, why are you still here? Why isn't Jesus taking you? You've obviously fulfilled your assignment. Because I'm still being made perfect. I don't use it as an excuse, but I'm on my journey, folks. And I'm learning and growing. And I've learned to be a better pastor over the last years because of the offense, because of the exclusion, and because of the ignoring. And I'm not closed off to correction. I'm not closed off to any of this stuff there. It takes me on a journey, folks. And let me tell you, folks, if you haven't been offended, trust me, you will get offended. Why do you think most people leave churches? Pick up your little pot plant and move to your next church. I am so offended by you, pastor. I can't believe he said that. I'm going to take off. <laughs> I'm going to Kloof. <laughs> Did Peter quit the ministry when he was called Satan? Get behind me, Satan. Peter goes, that's it. I'm out of here. I'm joining the kids' ministry. I'm moving to Cape Town. I'm going to View Church. Do you understand what I'm saying? Listen, he didn't leave. He didn't miss a beat. Cool? Test of ignored, test excluded, test offended. Okay, what's our response supposed to be? Let's learn from this beautiful woman. I'm going to finish in four minutes. This is going to be amazing. Who believes I can finish in four minutes? Ye of little faith, I see that one hand. Praise God. You're going to get an extra biscuit. Brandon, make sure she gets an extra biscuit. Okay, thanks, man. Our response needs to be the same as her. Number one, unashamed prayer. Unashamed prayer. What did she do? She just kept on speaking to him. Listen to this, right? She says, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. After, after being ignored and even the disciples saying the stuff, he, he, she still cries out. She still speaks out to him. She still calls out, Lord, help me. Let me tell you, folks, we have to create in our lives a culture of unashamed prayer. I, I want to say this, and I'm going to, speak very, I'm going to speak very strongly right now. I haven't even spoken strongly. Some of you haven't responded to an order call for a long time. There's something wrong with you. I love you enough to tell you this. You are stubborn and you are proud. And something has broken in you and it needs fixing. I can pick you out now. There's light shining on you right now because you're even getting a bit annoyed at what I'm saying right now. Some of you, your heart pounds at some of the messages that are preached, but pride in you stops you from responding to the order call. You won't respond to an order call anymore because something has locked you up and there's something wrong with that. You're leading nobody. You've got to soften that heart again and you've got to start responding again. I'm not doing that because I'm about to do an altar call, but some of us have lost the passion and the unashamed prayer and the humility it is to come down and go, I'm, I'm not in a good place. I don't even know what to ask for for prayer, but I just need prayer because something's not right inside of me. Some of you are angry right now and I don't know why you're angry and neither do you. Amen? Come on, folks. Now, listen, you need to understand, I'm not angry. This is my pastor's heart. I love you, and that's the problem. I wish I didn't. Because it'd be so much easier just to preach nice messages. But we're not in the business of just preaching nice messages. We're in the business of taking ground from the kingdom of darkness. Amen? Amen? And for some of you in this place here, there's a hard heart that's forming in your life, and it's robbing you of the joy of your salvation. It's robbing you of the joy of what it is to be a Christian and love Jesus Christ. And you can't remember the last time you responded to an order call, yet you've wanted to. And we've grown slowly to the point of God can just touch me here. You've settled for God's omnipresence when God wants you to seek His manifest presence. Omnipresence the prostitute's having right now while she's shooting up drugs or sleeping with someone. She has omnipresence. That requires no faith. Have we lost the ability to have unashamed prayer that responds to every altar call until we get what we came for? Where we push through the crowd even when we feel weak. Where we just go, gosh, man, I'll tell you, the people that I've been moved by the most are the guest preachers that I've seen respond to altar calls. 
where you just go, that's the great man of God. And they run to the front and fall on their face. And I go, if they're down there, I need to be down there because I was trying to convince everybody that I've got it all together. But if they're doing what they're doing, I need God. Come on, folks. Am I making sense to anybody here? Pastor Graham's got Danny Guglielmucci coming to his conference next year. He is one of the greatest heroes to me of the faith because he is so soft-hearted. The guy bulls his eyes out in the middle of a restaurant while you're in a conversation with him. It gets embarrassing. He always responds to everybody's altar call because he just wants to be soft-hearted before Jesus Christ. And I go, I want more of that because I've become the hard guy at times, sitting in the middle row with my arms folded, looking, going, I'm not responding. I've responded beforehand and nothing changed. And what I've suddenly realised is I haven't got unashamed prayer life anymore. I've got a hardened heart that's having a contention with God. Amen? How are we going, church? Praise God. Is this okay, Fiona? We're okay. We've got a, I've got a smile from Fiona. I'm happy. <laughs> unashamed prayer. Do we push through? Do we press in? Do we get prayed for? That's the first thing she did. The second thing she did is she had unconditional worship. Even after being ignored, even after being excluded, she still called him Lord. She still called him Master. She still worshipped him. Let me tell you, it was absolute worship. It was worship to the highest degree. She didn't let go. She had unconditional worship. Come on, folks. I, 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 I got to tell you, the praise and worship in this place is amazing. But you know what? Some of you will notice, I look around during praise and worship because I like to watch how people worship. And what I see from some of you is not much. I'm just being honest. I, I, please, listen, I don't, I don't want you to forgive me. You don't need to forgive me for what I watch. This is not worship. That's not worship. I'm sorry, that's not worship. That's not worship. Come and argue with me later and feel free to be wrong. Okay? You, you will not win this argument. That is not worship. That is standing still with your mouth closed. That's how I worship. I very much doubt it. Because if I take you to a rugby game, that's how you should be when your team's winning. And I bet you're not. I see grown men yelling at TV screens at a repeat game. You can't even change the result. But we come into the presence of God and go. And you wonder why your kids show love to you like that as well. My babies, my babies are 21 and 19. When I get home, I get big kisses. I get big hugs. My daughters will jump on me. They're big girls, but they still jump on me. I kiss my dad until the day he died. I want my dad to know I love him. I don't even care if he doesn't kiss me back, but he did. I love him. I don't express my, life, my love to my wife by going, sweetheart, check this out. <laughs> my wife would smack my face off and I would deserve it because that is not showing love. Amen? But that's how we show love to God? Please. Oh, that's just your Pentecostal heritage. It's got nothing to do with Pentecostal heritage. Amen? Are we Okay. Oh, I just got one more point. I, I did lie. I'm finishing late. Is that okay? She worshipped even when she was ignored. I've got to tell you, man, I wish I could learn to be that more so. Instead of waiting for the song I like. I didn't get anything out of the worship. The worship wasn't for you ever. Yeah, it, was, it, was for, it was for him. Some of us have forgotten that. Praise God. Last one is this. She had unconscious gratitude. What do I mean by this, folks? Listen to me. What did Jesus say? He said, it's not right for me to give the bread that was for my people and throw it to you, the dogs. And she said these words. She said, but even the dogs get the crumbs. Even the crumbs, man. I'll settle for crumbs. I don't need your full and undivided attention. I don't need everything to happen here, but God, just the crumbs, man. And she was grateful for the crumbs. We've lost our gratitude. If He's not doing the big in our life anymore, we feel upset and angry with Him. 
But have we not got that gratitude again that says, just the crumbs, man. Or oh, you'd give me the crumbs? You'd actually give me the crumbs? Have we lost that, guys? Have we lost the ability to just tap into God and say, all right, just the crumbs will be good. Even the dogs, God, they get the crumbs, man. Just, oh God, please, just the crumbs. Thank you for the crumbs. Thank you for the crumbs. I'll take the crumbs. We've become a spoiled generation, obese Christians. We're doing nothing. We come in with our spiritual serviettes. You better feed me again. But you do nothing to exercise it. And then we wonder why the food's running dry. Instead of getting an attitude and a gratitude that says, even the crumbs. Come in late to church and we leave early. What's happened to us? Oh, the traffic is bad. Who gives a rip about the traffic? We've got to get the gratitude again for the crumbs. Unconscious gratitude. What could God do with us if we would just fully surrender ourselves all over again to Him? Hang up that thing that's called pride and just pursue after Him. What was Jesus' reply? Woman, such great faith. I ignored you. I excluded you. I offended you and insulted you. And yet you still would hang around just for a crumb. Go ahead. Everything you've desired has happened. Isn't it amazing that the greatest lesson we can learn about pursuing after Jesus Christ is someone that was regarded as a heathen and a despised woman? Tells me what I can learn a lot when an unsaved person comes into the house of God. When a new Christian just gets converted. Let's be those type of people, amen? Let's allow that. I'd love to tell you that, that that's all my message. Not all my message. It's something that Pastor Mark spoke to us. It's something that we've been talking about a lot. It's just something new and afresh. And there's got to come something in our lives that say, I am not sitting back anymore. I want to be a part of something. I want to be a part of something and I just want to get rid of my pride. I want to get rid of my ego. I want to get rid of everything else and just go, God, if I get nothing else but the crumbs from your table, that itself will satisfy me. Better a crumb from the Lord's table than a feast from the enemy. Amen? Amen. I just feel we need to pray. You do what you need to do. This is your time with God. Right now, Father, in this place, we're so aware of your presence. We're so aware of your anointing. We're so aware of your spirit in this place. Holy Spirit, come and do what no one else can do. Come and move amongst us, Lord God. Father God, for every one of my family members that are in this place, myself included, God, let us never, ever turn back because of being ignored. Let us never, ever move away because we feel excluded. God, let us never allow our pride to get in the way when we feel insulted or offended, God. Lord, I speak over every single person right now that is doing business with you, Lord God, whatever it is that's tried to rob them of the joy of their salvation. Lord God, I speak over their lives, Lord God, and I remove that obstacle. I remove that wall. I remove that hurt. I remove that shell. I remove, remove that, that offence that has tried to come in and block them from pursuing after you, God. Father, even as David said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Lord God, Father, let us even have a gratitude for the crumbs, Lord God, that no matter what it is, Lord, if it falls from Your table, it must be amazing. Lord God, I pray, place in that a desire and a passion, Lord God, like never before. 
Holy Spirit, move in this place. Move in this place. You just spend a few more moments just talking to God. Just talking to God. His presence is here. His presence and His power is here. Come on.